Okay, so this uh, second course, we're talking more about the DIY. If you're actually going to want to build one of these things, uh, how does it work or what does it mean in, in your life? Um, um, again, you can buy the ready-to-fly one. I really suggest that's where you start. You don't try and do what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, um, this is for the more advanced guy. Yes, sir. One quick question. Is this a Raspberry Pi right here? Um, it, some of them are based off the Raspberry Pi. It's actually based off the Arduino, this uh, actual computer. So there's a, some of the first ones was actually um, Arduino computers. So, um, and there's still a whole bunch of these are called Arduino Pilot, which is from its Ar Arduino roots. So there's a main, its main computer is typically something like that. It's evolved beyond that now, but that's where it started, uh, Arduino computer, which is like a Raspberry Pi. On this part of the course, do you also cover the almost ready to fly? No. Uh, Almost ready to fly and bind and fly are two, two things. Um, bind and fly, like I said, is you're really just buying a quadcopter without the radio part. So you just bring your own radio because you already got a radio. You're just going to put the receiver in there, hook it up, and bind it. And now you can fly this quadcopter too with your same radio. So you can have 10 quadcopters and they're all bound to your radio. That's bind and fly. Almost ready to fly typically comes in kit form. That is, um, but it's not kit like in DIY. It's kit like in you have to install the propellers and you might have to install the radio. You might have to do a few more things, and then it's almost ready to fly. It's not as good as ready to fly, which comes with everything built, everything plugged in. You just take it and fly. That's ready to fly almost ready to fly is some assembly required, uh, put it that way. Yeah, the reason why I asked because I bought one and it okay. was almost ready to fly yeah. instead of ready to fly. Yeah, so it's some assembly required, yeah. that's what it says. So that's almost like that. So the DIY again, um, and uh, we went through this a little bit about who we are. Again, I'm Vivian Van Zyl, I'm known as Fun Fly FPV, the little fly logo down the bottom. You'll see a lot of my videos on YouTube and um, the DRC, which is our racing club. So, introductions what's FPV? We've been through that. What's the session about? What's a multi rotor? And then we really get into the actual part here is what are we building? And then we're going to go through all the parts the frame, the power, the ESCs, the motor, the battery, the flight controller, the receiver, the gear and the frame again. Right. Oh, somebody must have they messed this up, I'm sorry. Yeah, it has the frame in there twice. So, um, who we are again, uh, DRC, Drone Racing Club. I have a few handouts here. I don't know if you've got this already. Um, I don't know if you guys got one. I just give it to the guys yeah. behind you there. Okay, so um, and we are, uh, you know, a club from Atlanta. Please visit us. We fly every second week, even if you just come out to watch us fly. We're all over. We fly. Um, we have some nice fields where we fly. We have a great time. We're there for a couple of hours, and everybody has a good time. And there's a lot of people that will talk to you and tell you about it, and even give you stuff, you know. And they, they're so willing to share their, their experience with us. So please come out to our events. We're there. We're really there for, for everybody. So that's us. Um, and then um, the Mad Labs guy just left. A few of our partners is this site called Air Views. You'll see them on here. You'll also see them outside. They sort of a, a YouTube for uh, FPV videos. Mad Labs, the guys who, who sell you these kits, uh, he just left. Atlanta Hobby, which is in Atlanta. It's also a Grayson hobby, two big hobby places in Atlanta that will help you a lot. And then Runcam, uh, another sponsor, that's people that provide us these little cameras, the HD cameras. And then these guys from fpvlive.tv, again, um, I wonder if we, I don't know if how the reception is inside here, but if we were to go 
to FPV Live, the TV right now, we'll probably see the guys flying. So let me try that quickly. Live to TV. I don't know how the reception's going to be. Oh, it's very poor. Sorry. Um, try that for, for yourself. So this is a nice site. It's also run by our club. And we go to big events like this um, and put that out on the internet. So you can see them live racing. Um, and perhaps we can get a view of that. <coughs> nope. No luck. Um, they're actually racing as we speak. So um, that's who we are, Drone Racing Club. We're one of the premier clubs in the country. We, um, you know, there's clubs starting up everywhere, but we are really one of the bigger ones with a lot of resources, which a lot of smaller clubs. You now there's two or three guys maybe in the town. You know, I started a couple of years ago flying out at Chattahoochee Point in Swanee, and I was the only guy there. Now, if you go there on any Saturday, there's probably four or five guys and groups around you flying. You know, and if you come to our club events, there'll be 20, 30 people flying at the same time. So it, it's really growing as a sport um, and going everywhere. I explained FPV to you already. Uh, for those, is there anybody that still needs to understand what FPV is? You're good with that, right? You understand what that is? Everybody gets that? Don't have to go through that again. <clears throat> and then what's the session about? Uh, you know, we're going to talk about in depth about what all the parts are and then talk a little bit about the race. Again, here's a the explanation of a quadcopter and a hexacopter. I think we all got that, that some has four propellers, some has eight propellers and six propellers. I think we got that part. And then we're going to go into the bolt. And please understand there is some soldering skills required in building a quadcopter. Um, if you're going to do a DIY kit, you're going to need to be able to solder. And soldering is you have a soldering iron and some solder, and you need to be able to solder if you want to do a DIY kit, if you want to put it together like at component level like this. So what this course is not is we're, we're, I'm not going to actually solder anything for you. We're not going to go that deep into it. We're just going to talk about all the parts of it. But understand if you're actually going to do this, you need to be able to solve that. Okay, so let's discuss first of all the frame. And um, he's now taken the other frame, but I have a frame right here, a bare frame. This is an Eris 280 frame. And it's 280 because the distance between this propeller and this motor here is 280 millimeters diagonally across. So that puts it in a 280 class. You get um, ones that's smaller. We typically in the club fly 180 class, which is 180 millimeters between the two. This one, which is between 250 and 300, that's the second class. First class is between 150 and 250, 250 to 300, and then above 300, this one is a 450, I think. 450 or 550, meaning the distance between there is 450 millimeters. So this is by far the standard racing frame. Um, everybody flies either a 180 or a 250. This one's a 280, so it's in the second class up. This is the most popular class. So um, the frame, if you look at it, this one's made of carbon fiber. It's very light. Carbon fiber is a very strong material. And I'll give it to you now. And um, it's either carbon fiber or it's made of a G10, um, uh, which is uh, fiberglass. Um, it makes it very strong. Unlike this quadcopter, which is made of plastic, if I were to crash this one, it would almost be destroyed. This one I can crash 10 times every time I go out. And the only thing I'm going to break is the propellers, which are very cheap. But that's why this is made of fiberglass and a fi a fi um, carbon fiber. So it's very strong, but it can take a beating. And you can actually crash it and it won't break. But if you do break it, it has little bolts and you know, those things to screw off and the arm comes off. And you screw another arm on and you know, 
There you go. You have a quadcopter again, and you fix it. So that's the frame. The propellers, if we talk about propellers, they come in different sizes. There is a uh, four-inch propeller, small little propeller. That's typically on a 180 class quadcopter. You fly a four-inch propeller. There's a five-inch propeller. That's typically on these quadcopters. You'll fly a five-inch propeller. And that's on the 280 class. And then you can go up, of course, from there and have six and eight. And you see, this guy's got a nine-inch propeller. So that's much bigger. And the propeller is not only measured by its size, meaning it's from here to here, it's nine inches. But it's not just its size, it's also its pitch. You see it has a little pitch in there. And so a propeller is typically rated and it has a number on there and this one is called a 50-30. So 5 inches, 5-0, and 30, its pitch is 30 degrees. So this is a 50-30 prop. This one here is a 40-45, 4 inch and a 45 degree pitch. And the pitch makes difference in how much power the prop produces. Of course, a prop with a bigger pitch gives you much more power, but then your motor needs the ability to turn a pitch, a prop at that pitch. So the motor versus the prop versus the size versus the pitch, there's a lot of math in there that you need to understand. You can't just take any propeller and stick it on there and hope it flies. You need to understand the math between how much power you have, the size and the pitch of a propeller. So that's a little bit about the propellers. Um, the shape of a quadcopter, this copter is known as an H-copter, an H-quadcopter because it's in the H-form. There's a long piece in the middle and things coming out the side. That's an H-form. This guy is more in an X-form, meaning it's in an X. This, where this guy is more of an H, if that makes any sense. By far, the most racers would prefer an H because it gives you more place to put components and stuff inside. Where an X, you really just got this little piece in the middle to put something. An H gives you this longer area to mount more equipment inside. And then the cameras, we spoke a little bit about the cameras. You get a small FPV camera, like this one. That's the low resolution camera that's inside a quadcopter. At the pilot would view from. It's low resolution but high rate, meaning things happen in front of it and you immediately see it in your goggles. You can also mount on there a higher resolution like a GoPro type camera or a run cam. But these cameras, because they are high resolution cameras, by the time the camera has to take in all that information and high def record it, plus uh, uh, send it all the way to you on your goggles so you receive it and try and display it to you in IREP, there's a half a second delay. And if you're going at 65 miles an hour, you do not need to know half a second later that there was actually a tree in front of you. you know, so you want to fly with ro lower resolution at this time. Also, the, the, if, you, if you're flying at that high speed, you'll see all the, the pro pilots, they prefer lower resolution because it's just too much information for your brain to, especially if you're an FPV racing, you're going around a course, you don't want to see the scenery, you, you want to see what's next, you know, you don't care that there's all this stuff happening around you. But a guy who's flying this quadcopter, which is a filming quadcopter, he absolutely wants high depth. So what if he knows half a second later that there's a river down there? doesn't bother him, but he wants to see the scenery and look around. So he'll have a high dev uh, camera on there. This guy will have a low def definition, much faster camera, so, but he's flying. All he cares about is where's the next gate and how do I get through it? He doesn't care about the scenery. So that's a little bit about the cameras. So uh, the frame, of course, I spoke about uh, the material. So this is just to review what material this is about. And that's carbon fiber. The mounting options, 
there, um, H frame has much better mounting options, like I said, than an X frame. So you can mount things much easier on there. Um, the nuts and the bolts, pretty easy. You just tie them in there. But believe it or not, even those are made out of um, aluminum to keep the weight down. Because every gram on a quadcopter like this, a racing quadcopter, every gram that you don't have to pick up into the air with a propeller matters. So all these standoffs, everything's made of aluminum to make it as light as possible. So that's there. And then um, cameras, we spoke about that. We know that there's a front-looking camera, like this one, a low-resolution camera. And then you can also mount on top a higher-resolution GoPro, something like that for recording. And that's where most of those videos, if you look at our videos, you'll see people recording in high definition. That comes from these cameras. That's on top. So um, then looking at inside the motors and uh, there's a typical motor that's what a motor looks like it has three wires like the picture shows there between the motor with the propeller on top and you'll see there's a little nut over here that unscrews <coughs> and your propeller would fit on top there and put the nut back and that's our propeller fits onto uh, a motor but this motor has three wires and those three wires are connected to this thing which we call an ESC so motors comes in all shapes and sizes again you can see here's a 13 uh, 1306 motor see how tiny that is this is a 1806 motor see, uh, a little bit bigger that is a 22 motor. So as with the propellers, motors have a certain number. This one is called a 1306, meaning it's 13 millimeters wide and 06 high, 6 millimeters high. This is an 1806 motor. It's 18 millimeters across and 06 millimeters high. This motor over here has a 2836, oh god, that gets all wrong, but it's 28 across and very high. It's a very tall motor. So, but each one of these motors have a different output and a different amount and size of propeller it can swing. Obviously, you can't put a big propeller like that on a tiny motor like this. Um, so, on a tiny motor like that, we would put a tiny propeller a tiny propeller and motor like that you wouldn't put on a quadcopter like that you would put it on something small like this <laughs> so you see how it all goes together the size of a propeller versus the motor versus what you want to lift so that's very important on the motor so those motors are three wires that come out and that goes into this thing called the ESC and the ESC you will see as a microprocessor on there actually a computer on there and um, it has uh, these wires and that's let's call it its network connection to the main computer it also takes voltage and its main job is to convert the voltage into these three wires which turns the motor and this wire over here is the connection to the main computer and the main computer will tell this specific motor or computer on the motor that it needs this propeller to go fast. Like we said earlier, if we want to fly forward, um, the main computer will tell these computers, and, th and see how nice and big these ESCs are. That's a small one, that's a big one. So the main computer will tell these computers, I need your motor to speed up for me to move forward. And these computers will take care of spinning up the motors so they go fast and then your quadcopter is moving forward. Or if you want to go backwards, the main computer will tell these two computers, I need your motors to spin up fast, and they'll start spinning up fast, and the quadcopter will come back. So that's the job of an ESC. And uh, <coughs> ESCs are rated. Again, a tiny little ESC like this, you would not put on a big motor like that, because you need a huge battery and everything 
a tiny ESC like this would go onto a small computer or a small quadcopter like this for this. So again, there's a lot of math involved there and the club members can help you with that. Depends on what you need. <clears throat> and then the wiring loom, which is something like this. That's where, um, when all four of those are connected together. There's all four ESCs for a quadcopter if you're building it. It would look something like that. And uh, that's where your battery would plug in. And there's the four network connections coming up for each one of those that will go to the main computer. So the main computer has to talk to all four of these at the same time to tell it you know, what to do with every motor. Is that an I-squared C bus or uh, analog voltage or do you know? I think it's based on I-squared C on the sure. um, A little bit. I can find out through what it exactly is. I was hoping if it was I-squared C or SPI. Yeah, I, I think. Unfortunately, they tend to use the older was PWM. Yeah, which is. And now PPM. Yeah. And whenever, if you're, if you're trying to do your own stuff, you know microprocessor programming, it is a completely different, it is a standard, but it's completely different, and the libraries that you're familiar with working with don't apply. You have yeah. to find others, and they're very fledgling, so. Yeah, but, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a computer name. And yeah. like I said, it's PWM, which is pulse width modulation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's too technical for me. I don't go that deep into it. But essentially, there's a computer network, and it tells these four computers, and they have a processor on what to do with the motor. So that's the wiring room. And it's typically connected like that. The battery would run into the wiring loom, which will provide positive and negative to every one of these computers and every one of those compu uh, uh, computers have the three wires which connect up to the motors which of course turns the motor and this is a brushless motor so what it really does is the computer inside you will turn on the coils in, in sequence yeah. and um, um, if it spins um, and like I said earlier the direction is important these two go clockwise, those two go anti-clockwise. If you have a boulder quadcopter and the motor is spinning the wrong direction, just swap two of the wires around. And then it spin the other direction. So, although nowadays, lots of these, you can you know, just change the setting in the software and it will spin the other direction. So. Are all brushless motors like dual directional? Yes. Okay, now, I've not heard of a brushless motor that's Wonder. What does make them one directional is this thing called the, the hub or the threading hub. Right. So on this, the motor itself might be capable of spinning backwards, but on this hub, you will see as a positive thread. On this hub, it's also a positive thread. I don't know if I've got a negative thread. Ah, here's a negative thread mode. So this one actually loosens the other way because this is the one for the anti-direction. If you were to use the same on every one, if the, mode, if the propeller had to spin up, it would actually loosen the prop. So you have to use, but the motor can spin any direction. But so these motors, I don't like them because the, the, the thread is bolted on, it's part of the motor. Uh, other motors actually it's an adapter that goes on top so you can use any motor it depends on what adapter you put on whether it's a positive or negative or which way the thread goes so that's so they're all capable of spinning any direction but be careful of uh, the the thread for the propeller yes, I, i'm familiar with this argument i actually fall on the side of I prefer them to all be normal threaded and no reverse. Yeah. I'd rather use nylock. Yeah, you can use all sorts the, of... The fewer uh, parts that I have to carry. Yeah, you know, if, if you uh, try, uh, try going out there and finding a reverse nut, five millimeter reverse nut, <laughs> not many people carry those. So. Okay, so then uh, the next thing is... Um,
we're talking about how does the flight controller that's uh, the flight controller and here's an example of one this is called a CC3D another popular one is the NASE another popular one is this one here which is a uh, I believe is a RDO pilot um, and that is the main computer so this is the guy that is networked and talks to each one of these so each one of these computers would plug into here so there and into this computer is where your receiver plugs so basically your receiver receives the signal from your radio into this computer this computer has the sensors on how level the quadcopter is and what it's doing and what you're asking it to do and it will talk to these computers which in turn will turn the motors and that's what you see maybe on the next picture <coughs> there your receiver or your radio is talking to your receiver which is <coughs> something like this that plugs into your main computer so you're asking the, your radio which is here to uh, maybe move forward it will travel from there that instruction will travel from here into your receiver the receiver will tell your main computer he wants to move forward and your main computer will tell the smaller ESC computers hey I need the two back motors to spin up that's how it all fits together in a, in a row like that. Does that make sense? So that's what's depicted over there. So um, receivers, there's many receivers. We typically in a club fly 2.4 gigahertz receivers. There's a the old standard was 72 megahertz or something like that. But um, you could only have so many receivers. In the old days, RC there's a little peg and you have to take it and put it on your antenna only five people that can fly at the same time now on 2.4 gigahertz this is all digital meaning uh, every uh, uh, receiver and uh, or a radio and receiver there's a digital code being sent between the two and my little receiver I had here 12 seconds ago this receiver once bound to this radio will only listen to this radio so it will only receive instructions from this radio because there's a digital key between the two so um, and that's why we can have a hundred radios flying at the same time my ra my receiver will only listen to my radio so that problem has really been solved now in the old days like I said there was only these pegs and you can only fly five people now you can have a hundred people doesn't care because and they're all on the same frequency 2.4 gigahertz there are people who fly 1.3 gigahertz there are people who fly but those are guys who's flying 20 miles away on a wing or something like that you can do that but there's legal ramifications there you know you need a ham license and that kind of stuff if you want to go that far and uh, but in our club 99 percent of the people fly 2.4 with a radio like this and there's um, of course many makes and models of radios like I said earlier this is only a four channel typically people in the club fly what's known as the Tyrannus or um, um, there's a few others that's, that's quite popular I can't even think of them now but uh, um, and they have more channels the channels on this one the basic four channels but then they add maybe return to home or aggressiveness of your quadcopter um, uh, uh, what a lot of people do is they'll have a little camera in front here, the FPV camera. They'll have it on a servo so they can tilt it up and down um, so they can see better and stuff. And that's all by knobs you can add to the controller. But then it gets expensive. You know, your radio gets expensive once you go over that. But a good radio is a Tyrannus and it has, I think, 16 channels um, uh, available, not just four like that one. So that's pretty nice um, and then um, security um, uh, um, 
is, is solved in this because there's a digital key between us. There's no problem like in the old days. Uh, where well, the problem does come is when you add this thing on top of the other thing, and that's how the, the last piece, and that's adding FPV to this. So we spoke about the motors, we spoke about the ESCs, we spoke about the flight controller, we spoke about the receiver and the radio, but now we're adding FPV on top. And FPV typically is standalone, and we try and not let it interfere with anything else. And that is a camera in front, FPV camera in front, and an FPV transmitter at the end. So that typically looks like something like that. There's an FPV transmitter, and this thing runs on 5.8 gigahertz. This is a quite big one. Of course, inside you have is a little tiny one inside there. Inside this one, the FPV transmitter is over here. And um, this is what carries your video signal. And this runs on 5.8 gigahertz. Uh, the radio runs on 2.4 and this on 5.8. The big problem with this at the moment is it's not digital, it's still analog video travel. And that means there's only so many channels. If you come to an event, they're going to make you check in what frequency you're on because there's 32 channels available, but in reality you can only fly about four or six at the same time. So, um, and what the problem with that is, is I'm flying over the trees over there and suddenly my buddy turns on his quadcopter, which is on the same frequency as mine, and I'm looking at his feet. Meanwhile, I was over the trees over there, and now I'm looking at his feet. I have no idea where I am. I've, I'm looking at his feet. I don't know where I'm going. I have no idea. Uh, that is a huge problem we have in FPV. That's why even at this event, everybody had to come check in that flies FPV, because while a racer is up there in the parking deck going 65 miles an hour and somebody over here turns on, suddenly he's looking at the popcorn machine while he was about to go <laughs> through the gate, you know. It's a huge problem for us as we need to, you know, hopefully this will get solved in the future so that it's the same as this. But at the moment, in close proximity, only about four to six people can fly safely without interfering with one another. So since it's not a digital technology right now. It's not. Um, how do you go about pairing up transmitters and receivers? You mean this side on the 2.4? No, on the video side. On the video side, yeah. So there's various um, standards. There's called the, the Fat Shark standard or the Immersion standard. They have eight channels, pretty high up on the 5.8 gigahertz. Then there's the Boscam standard, which is a little bit lower. They have about 20 channels, um, and they're pretty close together, but then there's now the new, what's known as the race band channel, and they have, uh, I think, eight channels spaced apart. But all of those overlap, because there's only 32 available, so they all try and fit in there. So it depends on what standard you follow. In racing now, we follow race band, which is they spaced further apart, but they do overlap with the standard ones. Uh, so, and you can't solve it at the moment, because you know, even though I'm on race band, even if a guy turns on a quadcopter that's near my frequency, I will get interference from him and I'll lose signal on what I'm doing. So it's, this is a huge problem for us at the moment. Um, and solving this will be key in the future. Yes, it's, it seems like a tough time to get into FPV right now. Yeah. And I don't want that to stop me, but... Yeah, it's, it's tough because, you know, you go out to a field, there's a famous video of I'm, a, I'm an aeroplane. There's a guy really flying aggressively with his quadcopter, and the next thing, He's in a little aeroplane, and it's it's some kid flying FPV with a little aeroplane in it, and you just see his video go from like what happened? <laughs> and uh, and he just flew in front of him, and then he's overlapped, and it's just crazy. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yeah, that will be key to solve. But the problem is uh, the latency again. You know, any technology you build in there will make it slower, and we need. need you know, if you were using FPV and say you were flying 
and you switch to another frequency. Would the other person also switch to your frequency? Like would they go to your camera? And no, it typically it's done with dip switches like this, meaning I have to actually be at the quadcopter in even a small one like that, with little dip switches, and I will decide on what frequency I'm on. So I'll set those little switches there, and then I'll take my goggles and I'll tune in to the same frequency as mine. But if you were to accidentally do that, would the other person switch with yours? If you're too close and, and you're on the same frequency as his, you'll start seeing what your camera is displaying instead of yours. And that's the problem. So he's flying along and now suddenly he's looking at your camera instead of yours. So it's whoever turns theirs on last? Yeah, well, it's well, plus the strongest signal. Strongest signal. Who's closer Whoever's to you? Yeah. You know, so if, I mean, somebody can turn one on there and I'm over here, I'll be okay. But if that guy were to fly in front of me and come in between me and my, my quadcopter, his signal would be stronger than mine and I'll suddenly be seeing his video. You know, and, and would he see yours? No, yeah. And see uh, whoever's got the strongest signal again. Yes. Yeah. So if he would have to fly, would you see each other's videos? Yeah, he, he can see mine if, you know. So typically what you do if you get to a field of this, you'll know what your frequency is and you'll, you'll look to make sure there's nobody on that frequency already before you even turn on. But even that, you'll have to check in and tell people, I'm going to turn on now. Um, and especially if you turn on, uh, uh, the receiver will go through an initialization process where it will basically span or scan every frequency available and that will, for a split second, uh, let everybody's display flash. So if you just turn on your quadcopter, um, everybody's display is going to go but just for a split second. So experienced pilots know it's going to happen and they go, okay. But uh, you know, if there's a fairly new guy and he's you know, sweating and just barely hanging in there and you turn on your quadcopter and he goes through, I can't see anything for a, even a second, it's, it's disastrous. You know, so you really want to be very careful of that. Don't just turn on these things while you're at an event. And that's why, again, here at the event, everybody had to come and check in with us because we don't want people turning things on while people are flying. But that's only FPV now. That doesn't pertain to radio control. That's solved. So the transmitter and the receiver are paired. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the goggles have the receiver built into it. Uh, yeah, it has a receiver inside here. Yeah. Yep. So. But there's an FPV transmitter that goes on on the ray on the quadcopter itself. Yeah. And that's that one. And these two are paired with a dip switch set. So you say that your club is moving towards race band. Yeah, which is a specification. But the Fat Shark kind of is the biggest player in goggles right now. Yeah, and they support race band fully. Okay, so... so they are sort of a, the guys, them and Immersion RC are behind race band. So if you're shopping for Fat Shark stuff, try to get the newer yeah, no, uh, stuff. Get, get the newer, but everybody in the club, this is the absolute lowest quality one. It's called a uh, Fat Shark Teleporter V2. This was $199, cheapest goggles you can buy. But the receiver inside there is non-changeable. So if you buy, you should buy a what's known as a Fat Shark Dominator V2 or V3. And those one, the receiver is a module that comes out and can be replaced. So if you buy them now, you might get them with the standard Fat Shark channels. But you can, for $20, buy a fetch a uh, uh, race band uh, receiver module and plug it in and then it will be race band. With this one it can never be race band because it's stuck to fetch up. It's not for it. But then those goggles are four or five hundred dollars for a set. So it gets expensive. It really gets expensive. Um, and then of course we spoke about monitors. Lots of people fly with little monitors like this or even big monitors. We have guys with monitors, you know, 20 inch monitors that fly them like that. I mean, we have one guy who's a plumber. He'll pull his truck up and he'll have pipes hanging over and he has a big monitor and he'll hook it over his pipes and he'll sit on his tailgate and fly <laughs> like that, <laughs> you know. So uh, what, whatever you like. I mean, the monitor, some people prefer monitors, other people, serious people, 
in terms of racing have to have this because again uh, you can't be distracted if you this is much more immersive you're there um, you can't be having people walk past you and try and flying at 65 miles an hour so if you go to the field and you have a receiver you can just watch other people oh absolutely I mean but we have these lying around everywhere. And it doesn't interfere with them. No, because it's just a receiver, just a right? Receiver. So you you get there and you just turn on your receiver and you just swap to you play between the channels and see who's flying and you can follow them and watch it, see what they see. Go along for the ride. Go along for the ride. So we have spare of these lying at every event we have them lying around there. So just grab one and go with for the ride. We say jump on, you know, get on with the ride and I'll take you for a spin around the park. Yeah. If you were to um, have a lot of people join in on that one receiver, mm -hmm. would there be so many, res or one um, transmitter sending out a signal from the one drone, and say a lot of people wanted to see that guy because mm -hmm. he was in last yep. place and trying to get in first place, um, would eventually the signal get it try to transmit to so many different goggles. It's like it a radio. It, no, it's like radio station. It can transmit to one radio or a million radios. The signal doesn't repeat. It's a broadcast. And that's what this thing does. It's a, it broadcasts my FPV camera's view. And I can have one or 1,000 of these viewing as long as everybody's just on the same frequency. So that's not a problem, not a problem at all. And then we spoke a little bit about latency, of course, once the, oh, the resolution goes up, the latency comes down. Once you add encryption and security, the latency, all of that processing brings the latency down. And today, we just don't have that kind of processing to uh, make it safe, because even a 100 millisecond delay is too much. When you're, when you're racing. Uh, the next, uh, really, um, that's about it. Yeah. Um, we spoke a little bit about the races earlier. So do we have any any questions? Any other questions? I was kind of curious about, as far as getting used to the first person view, I yeah. know at first you might have a little bit of like queasiness. Yeah. Um, is it easier when you're flying it yourself versus trying to watch somebody else and you're kind of out of control? Yeah, I, I think what you should do is go sit around, get your goggles or your monitor or borrow, sit around and watch people do it. And they'll be flying, so sit down and try and stand up. And But it's easy because you, you're not, but once you start actually being in control of it, it gets, you know, I, I still, I, I sit and do this. <laughs> You know, and everyone it's like, what the hell are you doing? It's like, whoa, 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 go, no, 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 no. I actually do that physically still today because you get, it's so, you, you're there. I mean, you, you feel like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hit the tree. And, but you're not actually, and it's, it's very surreal. I mean, especially you hear the sound. I'm looking at the road I'm flying over and I'm behind me. And what your brain is very hard to comprehend that because I'm, I'm looking forward, but I'm hearing me behind. How does that even work? You know, so it's hard for your brain to figure out that like, you're there, but you're not really there. Yeah, you know? it's like you're about to hit a tree. It's like, oh no, I'm in a car, I'm about to hit a tree, 37 miles an hour. What am I gonna do? Yeah, and and the sound. I mean, especially if you're flying behind you, you you're looking forward, but you're hearing <laughs> you behind you. you know? Your brain has a hard time figuring that out. So it's it that does take some getting used to. Lots of people will actually put. Um, headphones and they'll put the sound from the pot so that they don't hear what's going on around them because it confuses yeah. them too much. Like the yeah. actual stuff. Thing. Yeah. So they'll put headphones in and listen to rather to the sound of the motors than to listen in real time and to listen to it in 3D. It gets, it's very confusing. <laughs> but you get used to it. I mean, as you can see, they, they all, but sit down, get a nice chair. A pilot typically has his favorite chair because he wants the same height, he wants the same position, and even how he holds the sticks is very important. You know, some fly with thumbs, like to play a video game. Others are pinches, they'll fly them like this. And then there even is, uh, it's called expo, 
how much movement do I need on the stick before it starts affecting or taking effect. So good pilots will have low expo, a minute movement would cause a lot of uh, um, tilt or pitch on the quadcopter. But an uh, inexperienced pilot, man, you can set the expo high so you can really bash the stick this way and it will just go up. But on a professional pilot, you'll, you'll see them actually just move it millimeters. Um, so and that's something you can, you can set? It's all settable inside. That's curious. So you set your expo, so as you get more proficient, you'll increase your expo. And uh, so you'll see a professional pilot really just do, doing this, very, very small movements. And they'll also be in very much control of his throttle. You know. Two questions. I don't remember what this one is. So if you, with the expo thing, if you were to move it up on the side where your throttle and where you swing your back landers, mm -hmm. would that affect the throttle also? So like, would the throttle be a lot more touchy? If you put a higher expo, yeah, uh, throttle typically you don't put expo on throttle. You typically only put expo on your pitch and roll. Throttle you want it to be really as much direct as you want. Now 100% needs to be 100% and 50-50. You know, you wouldn't want to put expo. So most radios don't even allow you expo on throttle. Because that is really a one-to-one -one relationship. But between these, you, you know, pitch or roll, you want expo. Important. The uh, C's, uh, are they rated in either uh, power consumption or uh, current consumption? So yeah, size, yeah, but your motor and all, or I mean your battery. Yeah, the small ESC like this is a, this is actually a nice ESC. It's a 20 amp one. They're typically 12 amps at this, so you can push 12 amps of power. This guy over here is rated at a whopping 30 amps, so you can push 30 amperes through this thing. Um, but see the size of the motor it has to swing. Yeah. So, uh, but this thing, this little quadcopter wouldn't even be able to lift one of those. You know, so this probably has got a much smaller. You know, it's all all mass between how much power versus how much weight versus. Yeah. Are there some nice um, guidelines online? Yes, absolutely. There's even sites you can go to. It will tell you this size propeller with this size ESC will give you this much thrust with this size, you know, it's all math. But that's what's nice if you buy a ready to fly kit, all of that math has been worked out for you. Right. If, if you're just going to go buy stuff, you need to work out the math. This size propeller with this size pitch, with that size motor, with this size ESC, with that size battery will give me this much weight. There's a whole, and there's sites with. It's like this big spreadsheet that will give you the sum. Do you know uh, yeah. which website? It I is? can get that for you. If you come to our, uh, just contact us in one DRC, I can give you a, a okay. site that will give you that kind of information. If you want to go real in depth on it, there's a lot of it, It's interesting. It really is interesting, you know, everything. It's almost like a gearbox. Um, a, a slow motor like this will give you a much bigger, stronger propeller, but it will only but very slow and, uh, and compared to a propeller a motor like this is a 3100 kV this one spins three times faster as that but I can only put a tiny little propeller on but the thrust on it is almost the same this, uh, because the mat I'm spinning much faster and spinning much slower but that's more a, a power one so I can lift maybe two or three kilograms for this. This one, I cannot lift that much, but I can still lift enough, and it's fast enough for flying. You know, uh, racing or something like that, you would use it. That you use for film, because once you get to 3100 kV revolutions, vibrations and the things really spinning so fast, and the camera is starting to jump, on that one, the propellers are just going to boo, 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 and it's much stronger, but much slower, but the vibrations of it. So there's a lot of sums in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having the uh, motors go opposite directions, that cancels out vibration and also cancels out the uh, it, right angles. Yeah, it's, it's called the prop wash of uh, um, the air below, air disturbance. 
So if everybody had to go in the same direction, first of all, you have a yaw problem, because um, they all yeah. the right yeah the right angle. So now uh, you know that's why they go in opposite direction first is so that the, the weight you're throwing doesn't make it go all in one direction. Two goes this way, two goes this way, so they cancel out. And then the second reason is the air disturbance below. If everybody went in the same direction, the air would sort of be doing this. Yeah. Now the air is doing that, that, and that, and that. It's sort of Down disturbing the, the air out to the same, you know, equally, instead of all to the same direction. So that's why. The three-bladed helicopter that you were mm -hmm. talking about earlier, does one of the blades actually turn directions then or something? Yeah, the one at the back is known. It's, sorry, we've done almost. <laughs> the one at the back is on a servo, and it can actually tilt. So um, those two would be in opposite directions, and the one at the back would tilt to the side, and that would make it, you know, do this kind of thing. Or if you tilt it this way, it would push it this way. So it's got nice yaw control. But at the loss of you're losing yeah. one propeller, so you're losing the amount of weight that you can carry. When you say yaw, that's the tilting. That's, that's the separate from pitch. Yeah, pitch is this kind of thing. That's roll, yaw is doing oh, okay. this, you know, turning on its own axis. Yaw, three letters, and it steers like a car. Yeah. You steer your car with yaw. Hopefully your car yeah, left and right. right. You know. right okay. <laughs> but, you know, if, if, if a pilot flies and he goes into a corner, uh, you know, a, a normal, uh, you can, of course, fly there, then turn left and fly this way, and turn left and fly this way. But in reality, how you fly is you use a combination of yaw and uh, roll and pitch. So as you come into the corner, you would actually drop the one side and you would yaw at the same time. And that's how you would turn it. You wouldn't actually do this, this, and then this. So as you start out, that's how you'll fly. You'll fly there, you'll turn left, and you'll turn left, and you'll come back. As you get experience, you'll do that will be a combination of the yaw and the roll and the pitch. But the computers on board do a lot of that for you. It's not as difficult as it sounds. <laughs> okay. You're good? Is he interested in that? Uh, yes, for a long time. He has a couple of times. Excellent. He wants to sell them now. Yeah. yeah, so come see us and we'll help you. Yeah. No but I don't want to be like super expensive. No, no, like I said, there's people who give you just come, come and hang out with us. Also, I don't want to have to go through all the trouble of first person view. I just want to have something that I can easily fly around. It might be big enough to go a little ways away and still see, or small enough to fly in the house and just walk behind it. Come see us. Yeah. I actually, nowadays, my kids in their rooms, I don't do room inspections anymore. I do it via drone. <laughs> fly around. Dirty laundry to the <laughs> yeah, I just fly there and check it out. <laughs> Thank you. It looks good. <laughs> so. <laughs> step on my So, um, but yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.